Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. In an industry that can easily take any person down a wrong and degrading path, she kept her head up. We were quite new in the film business. I think we were both grateful that we were working, for goodness sakes. And that was the most important thing in my life, acting. Her personality came through on the screen as being so genuine. Her elegance and her simplicity. Those two things don't always go together, but with her, it did. Paris, France. I worked at the Moulin Rouge. I felt that everybody loved me because I was beautiful. (laughs) Well, her caliber is rather extraordinary. She had a longevity that is unusual, and she was the genuine thing. She was a pioneer in a time and a place where this was not allowed. I've done movies where they didn't want me close to them, you know. It was not easy. And there was a whole question of stereotypical behavioral patterns that were required of so many of the African-American actors and actresses. Back in the days when Juanita first started, the African-Americans who would play domestics weren't even credited. They were just like the scenery. I'm not bringing the trays in anymore. Not. Sadly, a lot of people think that they came on the first train. I feel that it is unfortunate and really kind of sad that we forget the people who paved the way for us all to be where we are now. She portrayed me that she was a queen. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 491. Fresh off its Los Angeles premiere is A Star Without a Star, the untold Juanita Moore story, a documentary that chronicles the career of the late actress Juanita Moore, a prolific entertainer of the stage and screen who was also the fifth black woman to be nominated for an Academy Award. An insightful look into a pioneering yet unsung career of an influential performer in a continuous fight to have her legacy acknowledged, A Star Without a Store, the untold Juanita Moore story, also marks the feature film directorial debut of Kirk E. Kelly Khan, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Kirk, thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you so much. I really am delighted that you asked me. Well, absolutely. You know, when I first came across this documentary, um, it was just something that really intrigued me because, and it is with my great uh, ignorance uh, to say that I didn't know much about Juanita Moore's uh, filmography. Um, of course, Imitation of Life, I knew of, but like she had such a such a prolific um, career um, and that I think a lot of people need to know more about. And I'm just curious in regards to yourself. I know that uh, Juanita Moore was your, your your grandmother, but I also know that you are very much a, a student of um, Hollywood. You're an actor yourself. You're performing yourself. What was it about her career uh, that you think really stood out for you to the point where you really wanted to put this documentary together and really make sure that her legacy was told for people, um, not only in America, but from throughout the world as well? Well, um, I actually had a great um, life of learning and listening to all of her um, stories about Hollywood and meeting, you know, um, her peers as well as the most important thing would be her sending me for private lessons with Elizabeth Taylor and and Marlon Brando and and those those types. So, but when I really saw how amazing it was and how everything has changed today and it's different, it's still. Um, there's a lot of tradition in Hollywood, but then there's a lot that's not there from the golden era, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so 
I just thought it would be great to keep her legacy alive and in every aspect of it. Um, and then also not seeing her having a star on Hollywood Walks of Fame. And I just thought, and one thing she told me always is if Hollywood's not calling you in, you call Hollywood in and make your own stories, make your, you know, your own way, your own path. Don't wait for an agent or a manager or someone just to call you. Um, just make it happen for yourself. You make it happen. So, and mm-hmm. that's what I set out to do. The interesting thing about uh, Juanita Moore's story, and I think when it comes to the story about a lot of people from the older generations is that people tend to forget that they've lived a the life. You know, I think they just see mm-hmm. them as they are now and they forget that there's a history there. Juanita Moore was a woman of the world. She worked in London. She worked in Paris. She was on the stage in, in, in New York. She was in Hollywood in California. She rubbed shoulders with Brando and Monroe at the Actors Lab. I think that's really important that not only mm-hmm. we share her story, but to also say to a lot of people, hey, just because a person is elderly, just because a person is from an older generation, it doesn't mean that they don't have a history, they don't have a past, and they don't have a story to be told. I, I, that's something that I really found from your film anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's what I set out to do was to educate people and to show them that, you know, you know, sadly, we think that we are the first ones and we're mm-hmm. not. And we seem to forget, you know, uh, whose shoulders we stood upon. And I tried to do that in the film because I would hear stories of um, uh, Norma Jean. I'm sorry, Marilyn Monroe. Well, Norma yes. Jean was her name. I would, I would hear stories about um, all of her friends and, and how, you know, they only had one acting school then, you know, now there's thousands, <laughs> you know, and, and just to hear that you couldn't just walk in, you have to be, you know, really, you have to really know your craft. And it was just so much in telling that story and telling, you know, Oscar Michaud and so many that came way uh, way before and I remember that when I was trying to get the interviews of different people Quinn Tarantino and Denzel Washington and Whoopi Goldberg and um they all have assistants so I don't know if they got the the messages you know I just heard that they didn't have time or they would come back and reply and say no but then there was people like Shonda Rhimes um assistant or or agents or, or whatnot, and um, Lynn Nottage, and they would actually want to do it, but they were just too, too busy. And I didn't know that that was going to be a problem I was going to have, is trying to actually get um, people to speak on the behalf, but everyone is busy. So yeah, that's what I tried to, I wanted to teach people and, and keep it alive, keep the legacy alive of so many. Well, I think something that's really important in your documentary really shows how kind of like a, a time in America, a time in Hollywood where kind of like Hollywood kind of like interceded with these really kind of pivotal political kind of show, social moments that were happening at the time, one of them being the civil rights movement. And the other one, mm-hmm. which is I think people tend to forget about, is the whole era of McCarthyism. Um I mean, people think they have things bad now with cancel culture. I mean, back then that was the that was the government targeting people for p- perceived uh, political views and, and blacklisting them from their industry. I mean, that's something incredible. I mean, I imagine the the stories that uh, Juanita had for that time would have been um, not only absolutely incredible, but really showed to, to you as someone from a. a, a younger generation uh being you being her grandson just how far mm-hmm. uh, a lot has has come in such a when you think about it such a small small span of time because we're talking about the 50s and 60s that's only like maybe what anywhere between 50 to 70 years ago isn't it mm-hmm. that's right that's right and and you are so correct i mean when you hear those stories about the mccarthy era and and all that they went through people today would laugh i mean when people see the film they are actually going what (laughs) Mm. you know they're like is that correct because i know when we did it and when we um premiered the film at the film festival in montreal um boy if you could have just been in the audience to hear them gasp and go wow you know they didn't know they didn't know and and i'm i'm thinking everyone knows these stories but i have to remember that no everyone is not me everyone is not 
listening. Everyone is not trying to learn or have the experience and the, and the, the good fortune that I've had. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's crazy to see what they went through and having to sign in every day to work, you yeah. know, to sign in to go to work and and that they were all communist. And, you know, they were not, but that was the only way they could work, you know, as Sidney Poitier says in the film, they had to eat, they had to live. So they had to do what they had to do, but still try to keep their dignity and their pride, you know? Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And the other thing that was really important, I think, that the documentary shows is about how people like Juanita Moore and Sidney Poitier and others of her generation really had to tr- fight against stereotypes. This really mm-hmm. regards to the parts they were given, and that is part and parcel with even embedded racism, not only in Hollywood itself, but by society as a whole at the time. There's that great line in the movie where Juanita says she didn't want to carry the trays anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And that's like in, in reaction to after her Oscar nomination, she's like, okay, I've got this nomination now for Imitation of Life and I don't want to play these parts anymore. But that kind of led to like, what, two or three years of not being able to work on the screen. And I think it's really important mm-hmm. for people to know as well that, um, you know, the lack of diversity, not only in people who were represented on screen, but the parts available as well. I think that's really, really important, the parts available for people to play, especially people from uh, uh, African-American people, especially, and, and other minorities as well. There's, that's a really pivotal part of the whole story that I think people really, really need to understand when watching this film. Yes, yes, I agree 100% with everything you said. It is, it, it, it's, it's, it's needed, if you will. The, this film is so needed. And, you know, if I can say something to you, I didn't mm-hmm. set out the film after seeing it for so many years. You know, it was it was 19 years on and off. And when I say on and off, meaning that there was times we didn't have money. We're all actors. We're all trying to make it. There end up being like probably 20 of us that was trying to make the film happen. But I was the only one that was always stuck with it, if you will. Yes. No pun intended. And um, it, it's really, really difficult when you're doing this. So when I see the film out of all the years, and I, I don't want to say I lost grasp of it, but I really couldn't see what people were seeing. I knew what was there and what needed to be there. You understand? Mm-hmm. I knew what I needed to fight with, with all of the editors. And, and it was a struggle, you know, with the editors. And um, you have to, Tell them what you're feeling. Tell them what you see. Um, but, you know, sadly, some people feel that it's their film and their vision. And it's, it's neither. <laughs> it, it's not mine. It's not yours. It's, 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 um, it's Juanita's. And yeah. it's Sidney Poitier's and Louise Fletcher and Susan Coner, the great Susan Coner. It's, it, it's their vision. You understand? It, it's what they, what they went through that it's just not happening today. They, today, it's almost like they're just, it's almost as if they're just walking in and, and anything goes. Yes. I wanted to talk about um, the archive footage in the film because you had so much great footage here. you got different photographs, you got video, you have news clippings. I always um, find it so fascinating when talking to documentarians about finding not only the process of finding all this footage, but also the process of copyright, because it's really interesting because people forget, tend to forget that, you know, licenses need to be paid. It can be a very expensive process. What was that process uh, like for you and not only finding the, the, the footage, but also, you know, dealing with the businesses and the bureaucracies in regards to copyright and getting that stuff in your film? Funny, you should say that. Um, it was, it was crazy. It was, the, the people want their money. The people want their, their funds and they're going to charge you whatever needs to be charged. We tried to find free um, public domain or, what, or whatnot um, mm-hmm. footage if we could. Everything we could not. Um, so the film doesn't have a distributor now, but it's on its way to having some distrib- uh, distribution. Uh, but we we're in talks with them now um, and then, you know, they will take up what they need to take up we've paid so much of it and i tell you it's not it's not inexpensive okay and when you don't 
you have to borrow the money when you're a filmmaker you've got to you've got to have backers and you've got to be able to get it so the process of it was really something because now you have getty images and pawn five and so many that if you were to take a picture a photograph um they would just actually take that picture in about a year and then all of a sudden your own picture that you posted up from a, a festival or from a red carpet event or something now it's 499 dollars mm. you see so it, it's tricky and you can maybe um negotiate you can negotiate with them but um for the most part no you cannot did i answer your question on the copyright yes absolutely it's it's, because it's just a fascinating process to me i think because i've even talked to um uh filmmakers where they know the subject that they're covering like it could have been a person and that person themselves the subject of the film can't get copyright to their own material because it's owned by say a record label or a film Mm -hmm. company so it's such a such a a quagmire in a lot of ways to just dealing with the bureaucracies and all the licenses and stuff. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by TeePublic. TeePublic is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, TeePublic is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Amazon. The world's leading online store, Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. Another thing that's really interesting about your film is the narration. It's done by Jeffrey Poitier, who's the nephew of the, of the late Sidney Poitier. How did you come yes. about getting Jeffrey um, on, on the film? Wow. And, and i and I got to say, when I was listening wow. to his voice, I thought that I was listening to his uncle because it sounded exactly like him. He's got such that rich cadence that Sidney Poitier had. What was it like having him on board uh, to do an narration for the film? Okay, well, first off, everyone says that. <laughs> everyone says that they're like, how in the world did you get Sidney Poitier to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to narrate? And I was like, no, no, that's not what happened at all. Sidney was amazing. Sidney was you know, uh, most people say that the interview that is um, in the film with Sidney Poitier is something that they've never seen. They've never seen him like that before. Mm. They've never seen such a candid interview from him. He was just so down to earth. But actually, when we were there, uh, we're, one of the times we were there filming uh, at, on location at his home in Beverly Hills, um, I spoke to him about, you know, needing to get um, a um narrator or would I do the narration or something like that and that's how I found out uh about Jeffrey and so I didn't I later went ahead and looked up some of Jeffrey's work so it was years years and years later uh when I actually approached Jeffrey um and then when we did approach him we couldn't afford him (laughs) so um I bought dinner you know for him and his wife and and then while he was there um, doing the voice work of the days he was there, I would buy lunch every day and anything he wanted. If he needed an Uber, I would get a black car Uber, you know, and just find everything I needed to to get him. So it was so working with him was just delightful. Working with the both of them was just uh, out of this world. It really, really was. It was just, you know, for for when you're a director you are for me I, i'm very nervous um with the talent and want everything to work out but then all of a sudden you you're, you're at your you're at their beck and call if you will so whatever that they may need you know you have to supply because i'm a producer also also and producers produce mm-hmm. you know that so you got to figure it out and um so for me it was it was nerve-wracking 
but at the same time, it felt so great to have them and to be able to get the work done. And and as for Sidney Poitier, there was he had a great assistant um, that he's I'm sure is still the assistant for the family, uh, Sherry Brooks. She made everything happen. And there is just when I say exquisite, then the picture should be a photograph of Sherry Brooks. And I, I could not have done any of that without her. Um, and then, of course, Juanita would call him a couple of times as well to make sure that I can get in there. Because you just can't go and interview the great Sidney Poitier. You cannot. You know, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Uh, so it didn't matter the relationship or anything or however long you've known a person. Um, when you're talking about a documentary, it's a completely different story. Yeah, but absolutely. it was great. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was great well, for the both of them. Well, the narration is just fantastic throughout the film, and and like you said, I was one of those who was thinking to myself, surely he, did he get Sydney to do this? Was I, I'm not sure, but it was just <laughs> fantastic. And, and just reading up about um, Jeffrey, he's a filmmaker in his own writing New Orleans, I believe. And um, yeah, it's yes. just really, very really fascinating. So there's another line from the documentary where someone says, um, nothing is fair about the business. And, and that is a very real kind of true, true uh line right there. You know, they call from Hollywood. Louise Fletcher. From there Louise we, Fletcher. Mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of people, you know, say um Hollywood is the dream factory, but sometimes the dream factory can can become a thing of nightmares uh, for people not only um, uh, other people, but for Juanita herself, she had to endure quite a bit during her time in, in Hollywood. Um, but then you have what she had to endure post-Hollywood as well, especially in regards to the film's title, A Star Without a Star. How can it be that someone as, as pivotal, as enduring, as prolific as a Juanita Moore, Oscar-nominated actress, cannot does yeah. not have a star on the Walk of Fame? And it's really interesting. When I saw that, when I read about um, your documentary, I looked up, you know, just who is on the Walk of Fame and some of the some of the people that or, or things I might say that's a part of it is interesting. So Big Bird as a star, Bugs Bunny, uh the Chevy mm -hmm. Suburban, a car, a Kirk, a car mm -hmm. has a star there. Um Godzilla. <laughs> I mean, I mean the list goes goes on and on. Um yet mm -hmm. here is Juanita Moore, Oscar nominated actress and such a prolific and and pivotal uh, uh person throughout not only the filmmaking of the 60s and 70s not only in, in, in the screen but the stage as well when we're talking also about the Cambridge players and and working yeah. at the actors lab and, and working on Broadway and everywhere else and for, mm -hmm. in the film you have you show a um a, a talk with someone over there at the um, Hollywood Chamber of Commerce in regards to what it takes to take part to be, have your star on there and it was really kind of eye-opening <laughs> watching the, mm -hmm. the different bureaucratic processes that come with it. Um, I, I, I'm sure you were shocked yourself when you kind of came across that and had that uh, talk with the, with the person there. Um, so I have to ask, yes. what, what type of progress is there now in regards to trying to get her star on, on, a, on, on a Hollywood um, Walk of Fame? Well, our film came out in March of uh, 22 this year. And we sent it to a couple of film festivals, Cartridge and um, Cannes or Cannes Film Festival. And, you know, we found out the Cannes wasn't really a documentary film festival. But the problem that we had was instead of the film, you know, releasing it and, and we're doing it by film festivals, they actually called up, you know, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce to see if, it's, if it was correct. Because they looked at the film and they thought this could not be correct. Mm -hmm. I could want even more and not have a star. Well, because of that and because of the film, um, we ended up getting her a star. She she had there were other people that was trying as well, and other people that came on board to work along with um, the campaign. But instead of them waiting, uh, as we had asked them and Sydney Portier and whatnot, they went on and wanted to get the glory for themselves. But fortunately for us. It was the film that was released in March that really, really uh, did film festivals that really, really helped us and to get it there. So she will be getting one. The date is undecided as of mm. now. So we don't know if it'll be, I think, I think it'll be next year or, uh, or year after uh, that she will be getting a star. And then I thought about it and I said, you know what? I'm so glad that she will be getting a star. But the most important thing is that the film was more of a her history than about the star. 
Mm. And so I was so proud of myself and others um, to see that it, because we started out just with the film being about that. But then it ended up that there was just so much, uh, you know, film uh, of, of history, work history that she had that, that we could not ignore. It just could not be ignored at all. So we needed to do everything that we could to put everything in the film. And, and let's be clear, we'll have to have a director's cut because there is just so much footage that we just could not put in. We had to keep it trimmed as we could so about our star yeah she will be getting a star do we know when no but that's okay because now we have the film well that's really great progress and that's very great news to hear that she will be getting that star uh, hopefully it will be uh next year as you said hopefully it will coincide maybe with a general release in regards to film as well i think that'll be a really good uh good kind of like uh parallels there um that would be great you know, it would be great, absolutely. One, the thing I, I really loved about the documentary uh, "A Star Without a Star" is um, Juanita's um, positive, really kind of attitude towards her life, towards her work. She says at the end of the film, she's proud of her work. She is proud of her life. She went. She's done so much in her life, and she should. She should be as well. And everyone should be really proud of what she did. I'm curious, to, did you get a chance to see any of the footage that you put together um, while making the film, or was it too early in the process of making the film at that time for her to see um, anything uh, that you, from the documentary at that point? No. She saw um, she saw the, there's the um, footage, the, the footage that uh, we filmed at the home, you know, a couple of times when she had the striped fly, uh, uh, blouse on, and then once when she had the uh, white T-shirt on and that's how she wanted us to film her, she said it should be as real as possible and she didn't want to be glamorized. And we were like, what? But yeah, we went ahead and we filmed her and uh, she did get to see that because actually I used some of that film footage for um, a class of mine <laughs> to show them, you know, and um, I was getting a um, degree in uh, um, pr producing. I was focusing on producing at UCLA. And so um, I did show some of the class. So she did get to see that. And uh, she did like it. Um, but she had a lot to say, a lot more to say. And she was like, okay, turn the cameras back off. Let's do this. You know, take me to the doctor. Film me there. Film me at the grocery store. So that was great. And then uh, there was a Romel Foster. She's a filmmaker. And she said to me, you know, just all I can tell you what to do is film, 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 film. Just never stop filming her, filming her on everything she does, everything. And I did. I did. But yeah, she did get to see it. She did get she didn't get to see the the final project. She didn't get to see, you know, how great uh, you guys think the film is uh, or, or, or uh, it, how well it's received. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. So she didn't get to see all of that. But it was. Uh, it brings me to tears to see it. It really, really does. I think because I, I haven't really mourned her or, or, you know, Sydney or Louise. And it's just a shocker to see Sydney Poitier leave this year and then Louise Fletcher, who got in my hand all through the film. You know, Louise, Louise was there at the, from, she was just there from the beginning and she helped, she, oh my God, she was everything. And when I got the news, I was just outdone, outdone. So, no, they didn't get to see it. Now, Louise saw everything. And then Sydney saw some of the footage. But Louise was helping me make cuts. She was really, really there. And when I tell you, she is just one of the best uh, legendary actors or artists that we have and that we'll ever see is Louise Fletcher. So in answer to your question, yes, uh, she did see some of the footage. Well, i got to say this documentary um, is just fantastic. So for everyone listening, A Star Without a Star, the untold Juanita Moore story, I really encourage everyone to go to withoutastar.com. Uh, it's a website for the film. It's going to have all different types of information there. Um, uh, I'm sure that any type of news that's going to come out in regards to um, distribution, release dates, et cetera, will be all there uh, for people to to check up on and follow. Um, you can check out the film's trailer as well and learn more about the making of the movie. 
And um, yeah. Kirk Kelly Khan, I thank you so very much for your time today. Congratulations with the film. I think you did a real phenomenal job here. And hopefully um, we did yeah. get to see that uh, director's cut as well because more, more Juanita more in the world is uh, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, if, if, if that can happen, do let me know. And um, best of luck with the film's well. release. Uh, it's um, been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for including me in this. And, and I, I just can't thank you enough. It is, you're so appreciated. Thanks again. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.